Hi, I'm Eric Hansen. I'm the CTO and founder of SiteSpec. And we put together this video to uh, explain to information technology stakeholders uh, a number of different topics about the SiteSpec technology uh, and how it works and how it may fit into your infrastructure. Uh, chances are that if you're watching this video, it's because someone in your organization is considering SiteSpec for A-B testing, for personalization, uh, or for website recommendations. And uh, you may be tasked with trying to figure out um, how SiteSpec will work with your traffic, how it will integrate into your site, uh, and various other um, concerns or uh, questions that you may have uh, about how this is all going to fit together. Okay, so the first topic that we're going to cover is SiteSpec performance. And I want to uh, diagram out and articulate how different market options work, uh, including JavaScript client-side tools, uh, as well as SiteSpec proxy, uh, and also how that fits into server-side testing and server-side architectures. So to begin with, uh, I'm just going to start drawing out uh, typical uh, web flow of traffic where uh, you start with a web browser and you have a web server or web serving infrastructure uh, and of course these talk to each other over HTTP and every HTTP um, communication has a request and response so the browser asks for a page or a URL asset the web server responds the browser consumes that renders it, etc. And of course, every web page actually has many assets in it, uh, including the envelope, which is typically HTML, and then within it you've got images, JavaScript, CSS, other types of media, so on and so forth, and um, many pages may have dozens if not hundreds of assets, uh, and then of course there's also single page app frameworks, which will consume uh, larger JavaScript bundles and do a lot of additional work to render uh, and present that experience within the browser itself. Now, um, the first thing I'll talk through here is what happens when you use a uh, client-side tool, a JavaScript tool, uh, to conduct experimentation or personalization. In that scenario, the tag itself has been implemented within that website, within that page payload, so the response will include a script tag uh, potentially a tag manager will also introduce that script tag. But either way, when it gets to the browser, uh, the browser now has that additional tag. And when the browser starts to render its HTML and the images and CSS and all the other stuff that it got uh, served from the website or potentially other subdomains of that website, <clears throat> it sees that JavaScript tag. And it now has to load the tag from the JavaScript server. And this might be, just as some name brand examples, Adobe Target, Optimizely, uh, Monetate, so on and so forth. This tag uh, is served back to the browser in a response. And now the browser has the tag, uh, which is generally static. Uh, but in order to figure out what kind of experiments and personalization campaigns need to be loaded uh, and executed for that particular page view for that user, there's actually subsequent calls that the tag itself will make back to the tag server. So there's a whole sort of sideband of communication that needs to happen for all this to piece together. And once this is done, the browser can finally complete rendering of the page and present the experience to the end user. Now, there's some uh, key considerations or constraints that come into effect here. One is that you have a third-party server <clears throat> that is sending some JavaScript back to the browser, uh, and there are additional cookies and types of tracking mechanisms that need to come into play here for this to work correctly. And uh, browsers now have security constraints uh, by the likes of ITP and ETP, for uh, Chrome and for Safari. And these actually put restrictions on the time to live for the cookies that get set um, in the client. So JavaScript set cookies are gonna be subject to um, a much shorter duration of time. Uh, we have other content videos that explain this 
uh, if you want to look through our website at sitespec.com. Um, but that's the first sort of issue and compromise that you have to deal with is that um, a user that comes to the site and is served this experience and the cookies set accordingly, if they return to the site a week or 10 days or whatnot uh, later, then they may look like a complete new user because those cookies that were set have actually been automatically purged by the browser for privacy reasons. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that this content, of course, is loading from a third-party server. It's not loading from www.yoursite.com. It's loaded from uh, you know, something.vendor.com. <clears throat> so it is third-party. It requires additional HTTP connections to be opened up. It does not leverage the existing kept alive connections that are happening to your website. So that introduces some additional latency into the experience. <clears throat> and of course, each of these request and response pairs are round trips that simply add latency to the uh, entire page load time that's happening in the browser. And then the third thing, and this is really, uh, I guess, what a lot of people visually see when they use these types of products and they look for themselves during QA of tests and whatnot, is they will see something that quite often is uh, going to introduce a flicker effect into the user experience. So that's the name that the industry has come up to, uh, with to label this effect. But essentially what happens is, as this request hits the server, the response gives the essentially the default page uh, that is being served from the web serving architecture. It starts to load and render in the browser. But then this tag triggers, the tag executes, and it has to go load additional instructions and potentially change the experience, change the content that has already been rendered in the browser. So an example might be a banner in an image or a hero image on a home page uh, may actually load, and then the tag triggers and it says, "Oh, well, there's an experiment running, and we, you know, we need to swap out that image for a different one." So as the tag executes, it will actually make that swap, and the end user has loaded the initial page and seen the initial image, and now the that image will be swapped out for the test image. So it is a, um, an artifact that can cause some confusion uh, or irregular experience essentially for the end user. And not only is this potentially uh, confusing or harmful just from uh, a UX standpoint, but it actually can undermine your test data because different browsers and different uh, page load speeds and different devices, some may be more severely impacted by this flicker than others. And so you've got a scenario where you're collecting data about the experiment that you're running, and some people have seen Flickr and some haven't, and it's really quite difficult to discern whether the data that you've collected for an individual user has been tainted by Flickr or not. Um, so the best case, of course, is if you can avoid Flickr altogether. And um, tag-based tools generally, depending on the vendor, have a recipe to avoid Flickr, uh, but the way they do that is by telling the tag to trigger as early as possible in the page. So it actually will make those content swaps before they've even been painted into the render cycle of the browser. Uh, and that does work to avoid the flicker effect. Uh, it, however, it comes at the expense of latency. So you can avoid flicker by uh, loading and rendering this tag in a blocking manner. Uh, but the impact of that is to add latency to the page. If you don't want to add the latency uh, or less latency, then you can load these tags asynchronously, but then you're susceptible to Flickr. And it's really um, in a kind of an impossible uh, scenario to avoid both of those, uh, both of those downsides. So that's um, essentially what happens here. And in typical testing, and you, know, you can read third party uh, studies about this uh, that have done the analysis and the benchmark. But typically, uh, in what we see in our experience, JavaScript tags will add at least a thousand milliseconds, if not more, to the overall page load and page render. Uh, so, you know, time is money. Uh, and obviously, if you can reduce or eliminate uh, latency and certainly flicker, then uh, your end users will be better off for it, and you as a, as a business will be better off for it. So that is um, sort of the uh, sort of the baseline that you can expect from tag-based tools that are available on the market uh, that you may have experience with. <clears throat>
So now let's talk about how, uh, how SiteSpec works. And as I said, from uh, really early on, SiteSpec was created uh, specifically for large-scale experimentation on dynamic sites. And a key to that is being able to manipulate dynamic content. And the way we went about this was actually in a completely different manner than a client-side tool like JavaScript. And that is that we adopted uh, CDN-like architecture known as reverse proxies to manipulate content and essentially do all the work of assigning users to experiments and tracking the behavioral metrics that are important for your business and of course manipulating the content, the experience. Um, we're doing that all through a proxy server. So to diagram that out, um, this is essentially what it looks like. So you've got SiteSpec here. Um, and of course, this is not just a single SiteSpec server sitting somewhere. Um, in another segment of this video series, we'll talk about the SiteSpec infrastructure. Um, but diagrammatically, in the flow of traffic, uh, this is how it works. So the browser proxy browser makes its request to SiteSpec. SiteSpec proxies that request to the web origin. The response goes back through. Now, the web server doesn't know that there is a site that SiteSpec is in front of it. It's just any other request coming from a browser. So all the cookies, all the headers and stuff like that that the browser sends along, those are of course all retained uh, and sent to the web server. Web server simply sends back whatever page it would ordinarily send for that request. And as that response goes back through SiteSpec, SiteSpec is pattern matching on the content in the response and introducing the changes to the user experience that you have decided you want to execute, again, for testing and or for personalization, recommendations, and so on. Different types of optimization um, initiatives that you may be using SiteSpec for. So in a nutshell, that's how it works. Um, for uh, changes to the experience that are vis visual, so happening within the browser, SiteSpec is simply manipulating that HTML payload that's coming back from the website. And it does this uh, using, under the hood, regular expressions that happen extremely fast. They're compiled, and they um, can work um, tens of thousands within a second. So uh, there's really negligible latency that's introduced by making these changes. And the great thing is that as SiteSpec makes these changes and essentially sends the response to the browser, the experience has already been changed. Once it's in the browser, there's nothing else that the browser needs to do. There's no additional JavaScript. There's no third-party calls. Uh, there's nothing that the browser needs to um, uh, compute in terms of um, you know, looking at DOM objects or elements and doing swaps and whatnot. So in doing so, we eliminate that latency and we essentially completely avoid the flicker effect that you're going to see with uh, other types of approaches that use client-side technology. Now, another interesting thing about this sort of flow diagram is that not only can we manipulate the response, but we can also manipulate the request. And this is the core of what we call origin experiments. And we really pioneered this uh, in the market um, in the 2012, 2011, 2012 timeframe. And essentially what's happening is if you want to run a server-side experiment where um, some feature, functionality, some business logic, uh, or what have you that's on the web server needs to be manipulated or adjusted. On the request flow, SiteSpec actually is going to add a feature flag. And the feature flag can be either a cookie that SiteSpec essentially is simulating as a cookie header. It can be an arbitrary HTTP request header. Uh, it can even be something that gets appended to the URL. Um, and of course, again, the browser doesn't see this. This is something that SiteSpec is introducing on the request flow. So when that request hits your web server, uh, you could have code that sa simply says, you know, if feature flag equals green, then do this. If feature flag equals blue, then do that. One, zero, whatever value you want. Um, so this is a highly scalable, extremely performant way of signaling and triggering different behavior uh, at your website. Not only can we introduce this feature flags to change the behavior, but we can actually change the URL. 
So the URL might go to a different resource that you've published with your CMS so that it's hidden from the end user. But let's say the browser request index.html. Sitespec says this user is in a test. They're supposed to see an alternate version of index.html. And in your CMS, you've published index2.html. So Sitespec will actually change that request from index.html to proxy through as index2.html. Uh, so that's another option that you have, of course, unique to the proxy. Um, and finally, there is also the ability to proxy to entirely alternate origin servers. And this could be done for release purposes, uh, continuous deployment. Maybe you've got a blue-green uh, release that's going on where most traffic is being sent to the current prod server. Let's say that's the blue pool, and you want to take off a percentage of traffic and selectively route it into the green pool. Um, that is another option you have that, of course, leverages the proxy uh, and enables you to do that in a very, uh, very simple and powerful way. Now, to talk about the, um, we, we said in the proxy model, you really avoid the flicker effect because the content is essentially fully baked and fully cooked by the time it's sent back to the browser. But you might have the question about latency as well. And you'd be correct to presume that all of this doesn't come for free uh, from a latency standpoint. There is some negligible nominal latency that, be, that gets added. Um, in our um, actual measurement, you can expect 20 to 50 milliseconds of additional latency. And that covers network traversal as well as the different mechanics and manipulations that SiteSpec is actually doing itself um, within the SiteSpec layer. Uh, as these requests are proxied forward and the responses are proxied back. So this obviously is um, fairly nominal, um, but it is something. And um, there are a number of different features and capabilities that in the performance segment of this video we'll talk about that explains how we get this low and in fact how in certain scenarios you can do uh, actually even better. So, this is essentially the site spec proxy model. Um, one other thing that I want to highlight is in addition to the proxy, and the server side um, type experiments and campaigns that you can run, there is also a pure API method that we call engine API. Uh, the proxy and the engine API, they can work um, together in conjunction. They can also work completely separate. And what happens there is SiteSpec um, turns into an endpoint for API calls. So it can work, obviously, as the proxy, but concurrent with that, your browser can actually make API calls to SiteSpec which are terminated at SiteSpec and responded directly, and the server can do the same thing. So much in the same way that feature flags <coughs> can be sent through the proxy, feature flags can also be queried and consumed through the API method. Um, it is a very straightforward uh, REST API that you can find documentation for at developers.sitespec.com and gives you um, essentially all the power of doing campaign assignment and selecting users for different experiences, triggering metrics, and determining what kind of changes are supposed to happen. Um, the main difference with the API is that it's not actually directly manipulating the content. It's simply giving you instructions or flags about how your web server or your uh, client-side functionality should manipulate its content or experience. So these are the two things that you get out of the box with SiteSpec, and again, our aim is to give you a great power with minimal latency, really as uh, much performance uh, as is possible. So I hope you've gotten value out of this series of videos. Uh, I'm very happy to have any kind of conversation uh, directly or answer any questions, follow-up questions that you may have. Uh, you can email me directly, ehansen, that's E-H-A-N-S-E-N, -E at sitespec.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.